Hi, I'm Drew Hutchison. You're tuned to a special episode of, well, this isn't Local Bias, but this is Local Bias Presents. Um, we're coming to you from the studio of Greenfield Community Television. However, this is being shown in multiple outlets. Uh, with me are a couple of directors of other cable access stations, and I'm the cable access director for the town of Hadley. Uh, we are facing a crisis. The Federal Communications Commission, is it the Federal Communications Commission? Yes. Okay, yes. The FCC, uh, have proposed some rule changes uh, ostensibly to uh, bring about some greater competition to help the consumer. But the effect of these proposed rule changes uh, are dire for cable access. And uh, join me to help me understand this and to help you understand this are to my right, Chris Collins, the director of Frontier Cable Access Television in uh, the four town areas, Deerfield, yeah, Deerfield Sunderland. Sunderland, and Conway and Waitley. Conway and Waitley. And then on my left is Otis Wheeler, a counselor for the town of Greenfield and the cable director for two stations, uh, Northfield and Bernston, which is one station, and then Falls Cable, which is the um, Buckland and Shelburne Falls. Exactly. So thank you for joining me on short notice. Basically, the viewers, by the time they see this, you only will have a couple of weeks to take any action. Uh, so I don't know that that's going to make a difference. But what I'm hoping is that at least uh, those who do tune in will have an understanding of what is going on, and uh, it will help inform them. So uh, Otis, you've, how long have you been involved with cable access? I've been involved with cable access for 12 years now. I started uh, here at GCTV back in uh, 2006, and I've been at uh, Bernardson Northfield for, this will be my 10th year, and I've been managing uh, Falls Cable for seven years. So I've been, I've been in this industry for a while, and I've watched it change, and um, I'm worried about what this, what this would do to it. Well, you, we may lose our jobs. <laughs> That's, yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a financial component to this, which is, which is kind of scary for those of us who work in the industry. But um, how did you even get involved in cable in the first place? Yeah, I, so the way I got into it actually was through a temp job. At the time, uh, GCTV was going through changes. And I um, was in between things because I'd had um, an operation. And I was back in the area. I grew up here, but I was back after college. And uh, Harmon Temp Agency got me a gig here. And basically, at the time, they were like, if you could learn Final Cut in a week, I think you'll probably have a job. And I've been a tech savvy kid as long as I can remember. And so I did it, and I got really into it. And I got really into the opportunities that cable access provides and the the types of, you know, it's not just an office job, it's right. something that you're out in the community, you're meeting lots of different people, you are covering lots of different events. It's probably how I got into town government was mm -hmm. after watching so many and covering so many of these meetings, I, I noticed the importance mm -hmm. of it and, and how it works. And so it's really been a huge part of my life for a dozen years now. All right. That's, and, and Chris, what about yourself? You started with political potpourri, Martin Well, Gwine, No, actually, or? it started before that. I, I, much like Otis, I, I got out, I got involved in Access right out of college. Uh, the first show I ever produced was in 1992. It was here under, the, under Debbie Almeida's regime uh, called uh, Barney Terrell Sports Talk. Oh, okay. And we did live shoots from Taylor's Tavern. And that was the first work I'd done really in television. I'm primarily a radio guy. And uh, so... I was involved in that, and that lasted for a little while, and I started getting more into radio, and then I came back. Uh, after I got the job as news director at WHAI, uh, Marty McGuam was in charge of GCTV, and he had suggested, and I, much like Otis, I was covering a lot of these meetings, and I'm seeing stuff, and I'm like, geez, you know, it'd be good to do a kind of a show that had some perspective on not just, you know, what was happening, but Interpreting. What, it, what it meant. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's where political potpourri came in. And then we started doing Beacon Hill updates. We were having legislators on. And, and um, ironically enough, and very few people know this, but the political potpourri show actually got me the job as a columnist for the recorder. Because Tim Blagg happened to be watching GCTV one night, and he saw me doing a, one of my weekend reviews, cutting up sound from a council and select board meeting. And <clears throat> He called me and said, I want you to come in and meet with me on Monday. So I went in and he said, he said, you know, son, he said, I was watching that show of yours on GCTV. He said, I, I like that perspective. I want that perspective in our newspapers. So in the arena, which is my weekly column in the recorder, actually grew out of public access. 
So I would not be writing 19 years this fall for the recorder if it hadn't been for GCTV and political potpourri. So I, I owe Tim and I owe the station a lot. And I, I ended up getting back into access full time three years ago. Uh, FCAT was having a tough time finding an executive director. Doug Finn had left to become the town administrator in Deerfield. They were working with an interim director who didn't want the full time job. And I remember going in there and, and they were sort of like, why do you want to work here? And I said, because I believe that people have a right to know what's going on in the world. I believe in telling stories. I believe in the concept of public access. I think that they thought it would, that I, I, and truthfully, I, I didn't have, I was working you know, three or four jobs, and I wanted to, to make my mark in something other than radio. And I love that job. I love the, the medium. I love the concept. I love the fact that it provides an opportunity for people to learn not just about their government, but about what's going on in their community. So that's what drives me. So, it, and, and, and so that brings me to why I love community access television, because it is about community. I produce a show called Local Bias, and the idea behind Local Bias is that we have neighbors who are articulate, passionate, informed, and they're never going to be on the national networks. And so instead they can come on my show or they can come on anybody else's show on local cable access and it enriches our lives, it enriches our community, it brings us together. And there's not much profit to be made in that. No. But it's meaningful and it enriches our lives. Um, so these, these proposed regulations, basically there's a couple of them, change the way that cable access is funded from well, what I, I understand. I think there's a couple of things that people may not understand about how access works. And, and the way access is funded is every month you pay a cable bill. If you have a Comcast or whatever the cable company is in your area, there's what's called a franchise fee. It's, you know, it's like maybe 35, 40 cents, but everybody pays it. And that money goes to the individual communities in form of what's called PEG access funds, public, public education government funds. And those funds are what pay the salaries and pay for the equipment and pay for the lights and pay for the operating expenses of local access stations like ours. Um, people al always ask me, how, do, how, do you guys, how are you guys funded? Well, this is how it's funded. You don't even see it. You don't have any idea. It's not, a ta they're not, it's not the taxpayers no, paying not, for it. And, it's and, subscribers. And you'd be amazed at how many people don't understand that. They're like, well, it comes off our cable bill. I, I thought the town's paid for it. And there are communities where there's the, they're funding, there's a mechanism for towns to be to, pay, to supplement funding. But the, the way it works in my case, in my, and for my four towns, is the money goes into the individual towns from cable fees. I send them an invoice every quarter, and they send me a check based on the number of subscribers in a given area. So that our operating budget's like $160,000, $165,000 a year. Right. And we, but, but we cover four towns. Right. And, and so if this change goes through, it's going to affect every access station in the country, and it will reduce, at a minimum, that money by 30%. And in some cases, it could eliminate funding entirely. Right. And even though these cable companies or these towns have 10-year contracts with cable companies, every contract, Otis, you can speak to this in your case, has that's a clause right. that says if the FCC changes the regulations, then that supersedes the contract. Right. So you know, we just signed up. Waitley, Deerfield, and Sunderland just signed a new 10-year cable contract. Conway is negotiating one now, and there may not be any funding. And I, I don't know when this, this uh, ruling or this new set of proposed regulations goes into effect, but the comment period is, the deadline is mid-December. So right. people need to know about this and get on the stick and let, let the FCC know how important access is to them. So um, I will be putting up a graphic at some point in this program given information on where people can go to the FCC in order to comment on these regulations. But it's kind of dry and arcane, and, and it's hard to necessarily understand that, well, this is really what's going to happen. It's the sky really falling. Well, what we've seen in the cable industry, or cable access, is that people are cutting the cord, which fewer subscribers um, ultimately means that there's less money coming into the cable access stations. So our budgets are shrinking nonetheless. So there, there's, there's that issue going on. But well, in some cases, you have communities that are capping the amount of money they're giving to cable access, too, right. which is the case in Greenfield. Right. They did that unilaterally, but exactly. that's another... That's, a whole, <laughs> that's another kettle of fish, that's but it's, it's an important kettle. Right. Um, but they're also, on, on the one hand, the 
what they're looking to do is allow the cable companies, that is Comcast, Charter, Spectrum, to charge back to the towns or to the cable stations for services that up till now they've provided for free, such as connecting points. Right. Um, to having the, the modulators and you know it's, a, it's kind of arcane technical work um, and that's where we would possibly lose a certain percentage of our funding there's another more pernicious regulation in my mind and that's where the way that they determine the value of right of way right um, right now cable if a cable company wants to bring their services to a community they have to negotiate with the town and then they have a monopoly so Com Comcast is the only cable access, pro only the, the only uh, cable company that provides cable to the viewers of Greenfield. Correct. What the FCC would like to do is open this up to competition. Well, so that's the spin. Anyway. That's the spin. So, hey, you can get, you don't like Comcast? Well, Charter will now be able to bring, bring uh, cable to you. So that's great, except by taking away the right of way, that takes away the ability of the towns to negotiate with these entities. And so if they can't negotiate, well, then there's no funding. Exactly. That, that, that pretty much sums it up. And, and that's, I love, I love this idea of like charters licking their chops to get into Greenfield, you know what I mean? And, right. And I also think that, that, and maybe this is conspiracy theory, I don't know, but I feel like local access is a, a jumping point for a lot of alternative media sources. Sure. Shows like Democracy Now!, David Pakman, uh, shows that have been critical of this administration. Right. A lot of them began their syndication careers and continue them on local access stations. We run Democracy Now! In, on my station. Uh, I know David's basically running all over the country. Um, and you shut that down through a, an, an effort to increase competition and you cut off a vital opportunity for people to be critical of what's going on in this government. And I think that that plays more into this than we might think. So, so you think there was that motive that we I have think to, that there's, to quiet this voice? And maybe it's not a motive. Maybe it's just sort of a happy accident. Maybe it's just a fringe benefit right. of, of this effort to introduce competition. But it's, it's cutting off one more opportunity for people to voice their opinions and to learn about government and learn about what's going on in the world. It's dangerous, it's a slippery slope, and we're headed right down it. And certainly, um, the, the implications are that these regulations, if they get voted on, they pass. If a town values having cable access, they're gonna have to shift the responsibility for paying for the service to taxpayers. Assuming they wanna continue it. Assuming they, right, if they right. value it. And what I've noticed with municipalities is they often really do care very much about the coverage of their meetings because the voters want to see. When, when we have a, a technical issue and we're not able to show a meeting live, my phone is ringing off the yep, hook. me too. I'm getting emails. I'm getting complaints. Uh, so there are people that care about seeing what's going on in government. And part of the reasoning behind the cable act being passed in the first place was to create transparency. So often there would be these med public meetings, but because nobody was to attend them, we really didn't know what was going on. And now, and then on to the, on the other issue is that you may have a reporter covering it for a newspaper. Well, newspapers have been losing so much of their budget that they can't cover as many meetings as they used to. So that just means all of a sudden actions would take place. Or you're, or you're seeing the stories three and four days later. Right. And you know, there used to be a time when there was competition. Speaking of competition, there used to be a time when there were three, three papers fighting to cover Deerfield. Right. And now you've got one, and you're lucky if you see a story twice a week. Right. I remember when I was in the print business, it, it, we were competing all the time, and you had to get it in the next day. There were deadlines. There were expectations. Not anymore. Because, you know, the Internet and the 24-hour news cycle has sort of changed the rules, and social media has as well. People can get information much more quickly. But in, in the smaller towns that I cover, in the smaller towns that I serve, it's not that simple because a, a lot of these papers have given up. I mean, we're the, we're, we're the ball game. Even if it's gavel to gavel and there's no writing or perspective, that's how people find out what's going on. And there are people that, and you're right, I only hear when we don't have a meeting. Right. I never hear, oh, did, you did a great job of that planning board meeting. I always hear, where's the planning board meeting if we that's have a technical right. problem? And Otis probably has the same situation. It's, I have the same thing. People, you know, 
take it for granted that it's there. And if, if we're not there, if we don't cover the meeting live, if we don't live stream it to YouTube, that's when they get upset. And, and I'm worried that something like this could really undercut the entire industry and all of a sudden people who've taken this for granted, who've just assumed that government meetings will be covered, all of a sudden they can't be covered. And it comes back to the Cable Act again because all of us as stations exist because the FCC created these rules that essentially provided a mechanism for funding in exchange for uh, the cable company's access to the right of way, to the spectrum. Right. It's, it's, a fee, it's not a fee for service, but it's an agreement that really has a, has a, I don't know, this just has profound implications that undercut that agreement that had, you know, really came out of this idea of what do we value as a society? Do we value more than just the profit motive of a corporation? Right. Should they give something back? And that even speaks to the very beginning of television. When television was first invented, there were people that looked at it, this is great for the community. We have a way of exchanging information. And the profit motive hadn't been entered yet. Right. But shortly, so there was the idea that the product, like for instance, the big companies, NBC, CBS, ABC, they had a public trust. Mm -hmm. They had to have uh, the fair use doctrine existed mm -hmm. until Reagan got rid of it. So if you had competing ideas, they had a right to be heard. Mm -hmm. Well, that right does not exist anymore. And it used to be that the news divisions of <laughs> the big television companies were, non, were not expected to make a profit. They were news, that was something they did for the public. They're conveying information and they did it as journalists, that is, to the extent as possible, unbiased. That changed where the it, news divisions became subsumed by the entertainment divisions. Then it became about how much profit can we wring out of this news hour or this half hour. And the anchors became millionaires and they have their access and they have their, all of a sudden they don't want to upset the apple cart. And so what happens is that even if they don't intend not to share all the information, there is a little bit of pressure not to necessarily go after the hand that's feeding you. And that's one of the benefits of, of democracy now is it's not funded by advertisers. And so Amy Goodman does an amazing job as a journalist of digging deep into stories. But digging deep sometimes makes people uncomfortable because the truth is not always pretty. So that's a public service. And cable access stations do that on the national level by showing Democracy Now!, but they also show it on a local level. If somebody locally does not like what is going on, if they disagree with something, they have the right to come down to the cable access station and say, hey, I don't agree with X, what can I do about it? And the, either you, we would say, oh, well, here, we'll show you how to film yourself and we'll put it on TV and your neighbors can hear what you have to say. That's so powerful. Well, it's so I, powerful. I, I think there, the, but there's also shows like Flyby News. I mean, when the pipeline was in the area, for example, right. there was some tremendous programming that was done. Interviewing people would be affected by that pipeline. Now, I'm not saying that, that, that those shows necessarily were the reason why the pipeline thing fell through. There was obviously a lot of other things that happened. But that's the kind of stuff we talk about. That's the, that's the kind of programming that I think is, is most impactful. In, in the case of my station, we don't just do government. Right. We cover a lot of stuff at Frontier. We do a lot of, right, the most popular thing we do right now is we cover a lot of Frontier sports. Right. And we get underwriting support from the community, from business owners that want to support our efforts to bring those games. And, and so there's a lot more that, that access stations do than just gavel to gavel government. There's, there's programming that networks don't want any part of, right. that even the local regional channels don't want any part of, but that's in, that, that tell important stories about the communities we serve. And that, that stuff would go away. It just would disappear, it would, be, it would evaporate. Much like you know, family ownership of radio stations and television stations has evaporated. The more consolidation that happens, and the more regulations like this that get proffered, the less the little person, the regular person, has a voice, and it's, it just can't be allowed. So, but you, so you're talking about covering frontier. So you have there's an educational component. Yeah, and all our stations offer this, where if a student has an interest, we can design a curriculum for an intern to come in. To get it's free training. The equi that's one of the amazing things about it. And I yeah. tell people this all the time. They always their jaw kind of drops. What? It's free? 
Cable access is free for the community. If you belong to a community, you don't even have to be a subscriber. Right. If you belong to a community and you show up and say, I want to learn how to use a camera, I want to learn how to edit, it's there. In fact, the reason I do this as a living is because I was a volunteer on a TV right. show, and when I got laid off from my job as a printer for 20 years, I says, well, what can I do? So I started hanging out at GCTV, and the next thing you know, I'm being asked to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a professional. That, that all happened for free. I didn't have to pay right. for college courses. How many places can you go and get free training and do something that that's benefits society, gain a skill, and have a ton of fun? Well, FCAT, has, we have a very active sort of uh, volunteer base in the schools. Kevin Murphy, who's our outreach coordinator, is a teacher at Frontier. So I, we've hired I don't know how many kids that have come to us that have been working with Kevin since middle school. Right. I mean, Kevin's very active. We cover, we'll do a lot of concerts in the summer. A lot of the people who do the sports stuff, those are all kids that are learning on the job, volunteering. I mean, it, it's been a tremendous feeder for our organization. Right. And it's given these kids work experience. And one of the things that we always say, especially in the media business is, you know, you can go to college and go to get the best four-year degree and be, come out $80,000 in debt. If you have no practical work experience, then you're not gonna be able to get a job. Right. You can only learn so much in a classroom. You That's have right. to be out in the field, editing, doing, working, shooting, understanding camera angles and lighting. And making your mistakes. And making mistakes. And you know, that's the other thing, is there's no place for people to learn and make mistakes. And that's how, I mean, I learned, everything I learned in radio, I learned in the first two years by just being on the air all the time and making mistakes. Right. And now I don't make any mistakes because I learned on the job. It's, it's, we have made it so difficult for people, for young people to break into media. And this is one of the things that access can do. We can give those kids, give those young people, even give adults and older people that just have time on their hands, an act, a, a, a vehicle to be able to express themselves and to learn a craft. It's pretty important, and it's a whole lot more important than putting more money in a, a corporation's pocket. And, and what's so ironic about it, in a way, and it's the same thing with, with how newspapers are suffering, um, is that a lot of the online stories that you read, they're getting their information by reading newspapers. And so as the newspaper journalists end up, <laughs> as the newspaper journalists are fading away, it's harder and harder for the online commentators to find the evidence that they need right. to share in order to sh show what's going on. Right, and that brings up another good point, which is a lot of the, the correspondents, like the, say the uh, West County correspondent for the recorder, a lot of them end up watching our recordings oh. of meetings, of school committee meetings, or because they can't select be there in person, meetings. they don't maybe have they have a conflict. Whatever it is, they don't. You know, they can do it from home. They can rewind if they need to. You know, transcribe a quotation or whatever. That's just one of many things that is lost. I'll tell you what else is is interesting, and I found this in in my because we cover four towns. Um, the people that write the minutes of those meetings, like the town clerks yeah. and those people. They will, I've, I don't know how many times I've walked in this, because our offices are in Sunderland Town Hall, I'll walk in the town administrator is, is watching our, our meeting footage and writing down minutes. Right. I mean, and the, the Commonwealth just changed the law regarding minutes taking and, and the way um, towns are supposed to keep records. And so if, if we're not there, it's, it's like a tree falling in the forest. There's no one there to hear it. If we don't have those meetings available, then the people who create the public record in some of these towns won't have a vehicle to be able to create the public, unless they want to sit there for three hours in a meeting, and, and believe me, that's not the easiest thing in the world to do. But So there's a lot more layers to, to the service we provide than just you know, the elderly person who's at home who has nothing to do, who wants to watch gavel to gavel coverage of a planning board meeting. It's, 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 there's multiple platforms that this stuff is accessed, and if it goes away, I shudder to think what that will do for local democracy. I th think that pretty much sums it up. I shudder to think also what it will do for my job. <laughs> I mean, I like, I like doing what I do. I think that it benefits the community. We don't make a ton of money. The budget of my, uh, of Hadley Media is around $70,000. It's not a ton of money, but the cable industry apparently needs it. Um, <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> and um, so Otis, Otis Wheeler, thank you so much for, thank for you, sharing your thoughts. 
Chris, thank you so much for sharing your Happy thoughts. Happy to do it. This is something where, this is small d democracy. This is where every person has a voice. And our voices are gonna be muted if we don't take action. So please, be informed. I'll share the information um, where, where you can go to the FCC and make a statement, make a, uh, make a comment. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Take care.